Namaste. Namaste. So, today is um, CK Sunday, which is not Calvin Klein, but Christ the King. And I had resigned myself to not talk about Christ the King. I had decided intentionally not to. Because when I was a part of my first church where everything was castrated for our protection and gender inclusive language was the idol of the day. Now there's nothing wrong with gender inclusive language, but whatever becomes the most important thing, that's your idol. And for them it was, but not only was it important that we have gender inclusive language, we also needed to eviscerate and emasculate any male imagery to the best of our abilities. And so Christ the King was fair potent. One didn't talk about that. You might talk about, oh, Christ the Sovereign, or, yes. <laughs> How is that any better? The sovereign or, could be a female. <laughs> it could be. Well, but the thing was that when queens were in charge of a land, it was still called a kingdom. But they talked about queendoms and what was the other thing that drove me nuts? RuPaul's oh, RuPaul's got one of those. What's kingdom. that? RuPaul's got a kingdom. Yes, RuPaul has a kingdom. That, gets, that could get me down a whole other tangent. Sorry. I'm not going there. No, that's okay. And the other thing they loved was dominion. The root of which, of course, is to dominate. Dominate, yeah. So there was a lot of confusion. So, as you might imagine, in reaction to that for a long time, I loved talking about Christ the King on Christ the King Sunday. Until I realized that essentially talking about Christ the King is doing the small c Catholic equivalent of taking the country for Jesus. Mm. <laughs> and the problem really is this. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and called Jesus to him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked. Jesus replied, do you ask this of your own accord, or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Jesus said, I don't know, drop your pants. Oh, sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> but, I, but I couldn't resist it. That was obvious. Wow. Is it your own people and chief priests who have, I'm oh, sorry, it is your own people and chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, here it comes. Mine is not a kingdom of this world. And he continues. So, while Christ the King has been a time, oh, at times a comforting image to me, and while I would say that what it really means is, in the end, God's love wins, I think we have to find a different way to talk about that. Because if we talk about it in images that sound militaristic, then we're really doing the same thing that fundamentalist wackos are doing when they're going to take this country for the Lord. And we need to understand that that isn't the way it works. It didn't work that way, although Israel thought it did. And they thought the Messiah was going to be sort of a somewhat delayed successor of King David restoring Israel to the good old glory days. Make it great again? Make it great again. But then there's that Springsteen song that really informs the problem with glory days. Oh, true. And that is that if you get stuck in remembering glory days, which may or may not ever have been, you don't move forward. And so, if we're going to kind of, not kind of, if we're going to actually shift gears from a salvation slash forgiveness perspective to a wisdom perspective. And if we're going to say that the point of this all 
isn't that we grovel enough before God and then if we're lucky, uh, God gets us out of certain jams that we're in and moves us about and move to a place where the point of it all is growing into, excuse me, <laughs> growing into that example that Jesus set before us without going so far that we make the whole thing so benign that we might as well forget it. We need to get to the place where we see that God is present in our lives in ways that perhaps we've been trained to overlook. I mean, we're waiting for the big dramatic spectacle. It's why we love, and there's nothing wrong with them, live nativity scenes. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's, it, in the words of somebody who some of us are too young to remember, it's a really big shoe. <laughs> <laughs> a really big shoe. Lawrence, baby. A bad, a bad Ed Sullivan thing. Or, that's what I meant. What did I say? Lawrence Welk? Huh? Lawrence Welk. That's, no, I meant the other one. That's a one and the two. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's not most often. It, no. It's most often not a really big shield. It's little yet powerful things. It's a presence. Not E-N-T-S, but E-N-S-E, C-E, whatever. C -E. Depends if you're in England or not. It's that feeling. And I was sitting at home trying to come up with images to try and, and, and point towards what that presence is and what that experience is. And wouldn't you know it, I thought about it last night when we walked out of the cold in Chicago and into a warm building. Mm. And that, that way that heat penetrates us when we move from being cold into a warm place. It's also not unlike that feeling of deja vu. And it's also like, without the poor judgment that often gets thrown in, that initial feeling of being in love. But it's also like being with somebody when they die. Or when they're born or giving birth. There is a powerful, subtle quality to the authentic presence of God and the authentic Christ presence that isn't limited to the flashy. Because in the end, the flashy is a thin line from the tacky. <laughs> you know, you can go from really effective showmanship into being campy in about two words, where it just pushes it over the top. And, and I think that sort of thing is the battle that we wage. We're waiting for the flash. And once in a while we get it. But much more often the presence and the nurturing of God occurs in ways that are much more subtle. And perhaps only appreciated after the fact. When we sit back and reflect on something that happens and realize, yes, God was there. But in the middle of it, either the significance wasn't there, the, the campiness didn't happen, or we were too absorbed in what was going on to notice. And that's why I believe it's the mystics who do notice, because it's the mystics who learn to slow things down. It's the mystics who would much rather participate in the experience of the presence of God than explain it. Because they recognize that the presence of God goes beyond explanation. They recognize that while for some it's wonderful, helpful imagery, uh, Jesus isn't going to come gliding in on a magic carpet to save the day. But the difficulty 
that you also, if you're going to take this wisdom perspective, need to surrender certainty. And human beings love certainty. So human beings love this stuff like take the nation for Jesus. But the problem is, not only can't you do that, or if you could do it, what you'd have to do to be able to do it would mean that you weren't really taking it for Jesus at all. True. Because what you'd have to do is quell dissent, or ship it away, or box it up. And you end up being not a very Christ-like figure at all. The question is, can we live in the uncertainty? Might we understand faith to be the ability to sit in that uncertainty and trust that if we move in cooperation with that uncertainty, it will work out okay in the end. But that doesn't mean we sit by passively and just wait for somebody to do it. It's an active and a contemplative call. It's both. But it is a benign fierceness. If you can imagine that. It is a assertive but not aggressive and still loving intervention. It's everything that people like Gandhi show us it can be, but that requires a whole lot of investment and a whole lot of risk. Somebody once said, and I honestly don't remember who, that for a Christian, the worst outcome was not death. That a person of faith recognizes that there are worse things than death. That in the end, somebody famous said this too, if you want to save your life, you're going to have to give it away. And when we hear that kind of thing, we immediately think about our physical well-being and self-preservation and all that. And that may be part of it, but it's not the point. If we're thankful, it goes a lot farther than gorging ourselves with food and passing out in an easy chair, although I am thankful for both of those things. But, but if we're genuinely thankful, then it's reflected, hopefully, I guess, in what we say, but much more importantly in what we do, in how we act, in the changes that we make that reflect the fact that our thankfulness leads us to value life more, to value others more, and to value the small and the subtle, wherever it appears. Amen. Amen.